most significant benefits we have living, working, studying at the University of Houston and being in Texas is the broad range of people that we get to meet from various countries and backgrounds, cultures and religions. So it's one reason that a talk on immigration will really resonate, whether it is something that you are interested in or perhaps something that has affected your family and your lives personally. I am very excited to introduce Judge Richard Walton today as our Grand Challenges speaker. And tonight, I'm calling my parents to let them know how he did, <laughs> because Judge Walton is my brother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a glorious day today. I appreciate all of you coming on such a, a wonderful day. Um, originally, uh, I was going to speak about the trade of Mookie Beck from the Red Sox <laughs> and how it was going to change the American League uh, balance of power, but I saw a Wednesday that was supposed to be talking about moving on, so I readjusted my talk about moving on, and it's moving on uh, uh, with the baggage that you're going to bring with you. My, uh, about myself real quick, first of all, anything I say does not come from the Department of Justice or any administration. Uh, it comes from me, it's personal, and they make me say that, so that's why I'm telling them. Um, the other thing about uh, me, uh, one of the things that if you don't get anything from this, there's an old Jewish saying uh, that if you want God to laugh, tell him you've made plans. <laughs> now all of you are young, you're all bright, and you all have an idea what you want to do. Let me just give you an encapsule of how I got to where I am now. Um, I wanted to go to school. I went to this little school in New Hampshire, Plymouth State College, which is now Plymouth State University. The reason I went there is because my guidance counselor said that's basically the only place you're going to get in. Okay? And I wanted to be a bio major. I wanted to be a marine biology major because I like lobster and I like plants. <laughs> uh, but after a year, I realized that I didn't like sitting in a laboratory. I'm a I like being in front of people, like, like you. And, um, and so I switched to English. And switching to English was fun because I like reading and so forth. And, but this was before internet. I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated, so I looked in the book, and it was English, and what you can do with an English major, and the first thing was a lawyer. And I said, well, I like to argue. <laughs> so I went down to the local courthouse in Plymouth, New Hampshire, a town of 1,500 people, and it was a case of a student who had shoplifted some cheese. And they actually had a little trial, and I said, this is cool, I could do this. <laughs> so fast forward, I became a lawyer in Rhode Island, I'm still a lawyer in Rhode Island, but for whatever reason, which is sometime when we're drinking beer, I can explain to you, I moved to California. And I answered a newspaper ad, because the internet wasn't invented, and it said, out-of-state lawyer wanted. And this was 1986, when the great amnesty started. I got the job. Now it's my universe. I've been a judge for 25 years, and I decide who gets the American dream and who doesn't. So what I wanted when I say just keep going, what kind of baggage do you take with you? What I mean is, what is an American? So, I'm going to ask you, if I raise your hand to respond, but what is an American? Anybody? You don't know what Americans are? Yes, sir. Uh, somebody who subscribes to the United States Constitution. Okay. Subscribe to the, I'm not going to get political here, but there are people who may not subscribe to the Constitution, but they're still American. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I mean, there may be people who are, uh, that just 
who were born here and raised here and sit on the couch eating Cheetos that could care less about the Constitution on, on a cerebral way. Anyone else? I mean, obviously, someone that's a citizen would be an American, right, if you were born in the United States, uh, until they change that. You'd be a citizen. If you're born in Japan, for example, you're not a citizen. If you're born in Japan, you're only a citizen if your grandfather was born in Japan as well. That's what they have. That's their rule. So, you have people that were that are born here. Then you've got lawful permanent residents or green card holders. <coughs> Do we consider them to be Americans? There are green card holders who have been here for 40, 50 years and never got to become citizens because they never applied. They never wanted to. They never were invested, but do we consider themselves, do we consider them Americans? And then you have the DACA people, people that were brought here as little toddlers, as children, and have lived here through U of H, moved on to some profession. Are they American? The, I, you know, when you look internationally, what makes an Italian? What makes a Peruvian? What makes a Guatemalan? Well, part of it is a commonality of experience. Uh, the commonality of the culture, if you will. I mean, the things that we go through. And when I was, I hate to say when I was your age, but when I was an undergraduate, say, I hated history. I didn't want to know history. How does the Middle Ages have anything to do with my life? So I became, as I told you, an English major. Little did I know they snuck history into the literature. And it forced me to learn history through the writings of people throughout the ages. So what I've done there's two, two parts to what I'm going to do. I could actually teach a whole course on this, and I'm sure you all would love it. <laughs> but I've got to narrow this down to 30 minutes. So what I want to talk about is the commonality of experiences that shaped America through my reasoning uh, uh, from different centuries, vis-a-vis -vis the immigra immigrant experience, and then we're going to talk about the American dream. When my sister asked me to speak, I said, I'm going to speak on the American dream, actually. Uh, I want to talk about what that is, because people throw that term out all the time, and I don't think everyone really understands what that is. So let's look real quick. I'm going to look at my watch, because I want to get this in, and I want to entertain any questions that you may have. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, so, when you ask what is America, you can always go to the Childish Gambino uh, model, because that's what his song, This is America. And if you can understand every fourth word, you might be able to get what he's talking about, being of my generation, I don't really understand what he's talking about, but it has a really good rhythm to it. <laughs> So, how is America formed? What is the role of religion, and why do so many people want to come here, and so many people hate us at the same time? So let's look at the 17th and 18th century. This is when the Pilgrims came. This is the time when the Constitution was actually formed. In the beginning, the immigrants were primarily Dutch and English. Why? Because they had the votes. Simple. We also have the indigenous people that were already here, and that's we're going to talk more about that. Uh, you have the Boston Brahmins. You have the people that own the boats, uh, and uh, we're related to the people that own the boats. Uh, and then you have. I, I, I want to talk just as an aside. I just read this thing about Thanksgiving. We always think of Thanksgiving with the indigenous people, the Indians, if you will, and uh, the pilgrims coming together because they wanted to create harmony. That's not actually what I just read not too long ago in this past Thanksgiving, was that the Wampanoags 
uh, wanted to eat uh, with the uh, pilgrims because they were buying guns to go after the Narragansett Indians, what another tribe in New England. I thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, I digress. Okay, so in the 17th and 18th centuries, that is uh, 1600s, 1700s, we started Manifest Destiny. We wanted to fill this country, so all immigrants were welcome. Bring everybody in. Have Oklahoma if you want it. Can does any of the flyover states? Just help yourself, and uh, and we'll deal with it. Then the Spanish came, and they took over uh, Texas. No offense, Texans, um, and California and so forth, and, and that happened. The Bill of Rights also came. And America was this bucolic place where anything could happen, except if you were of African descent, Jewish, or Muslim. Then the 19th century came. And the 19th century, the 1800s, the, um, and I stopped because there was something else that I was going to get to. The uh, American identity is, was solidified. There were two books, I told you that I, I was going to get history through literature. Uh, two books. Uh, one uh, was uh, Walt Whitman, I Hear America Singing. And if you remember me from five years ago, I always usually start my talk with that. I'm going to read something to you about that in a minute. And the other uh, is Mark Twain, Innocence Abroad in the New Pilgrim Process. The first was written in 1860, the second one was written in 1869. Uh, Mark Twain, Innocence Abroad, uh, I find it, it, it's written almost comical because it's these Americans now going overseas to the Holy Land and to Europe. And so that means America had an identity. We're American, Americans and we're going over there. Um, Another aside, how did we get, is there any linguists in the house? No? How, how did we get various southern accents when just a couple of decades before that we were part of England? I mean, there's a Kentucky accent, a North Carolina, Carolina accent, there's East Texas, there's West Texas, and in the 1800s we had those. But anyway, I think we're <laughs> I mean, you see the movies of, uh, of Huckleberry, not Huckleberry, well, Huckleberry Ben, and they have, have these accents, and I, I don't understand how, how we change those. And here, I hear America singing, again, as a literature uh, major, uh, he talks about the America singing, and it's a chorus, a very uh, carol. He talks the carpenter singing as he measures his plane for beam, the mason singing as he makes ready for work, the boatman singing of what belongs to him, the shoemaker, the woodcutter. He throws women in there as uh, sewing and washing. And that was it. And he says, this day belongs to the day, singing with open mouth and strong melodious songs. Okay, Whitman, a great poet, a great writer, was talking about the fabric of America. He's talking about how the idea that we had as Americans that we have broad shoulders, the can-do-it attitude, and we're not going to be pushed around, we'll do what we have to do because I can build a boat, I can do this, and, and they're all integrated into one fabric. Now all of you are strands of string that are going to eventually build, keep building this fabric as you move on. See, so I threw that in there. But, but the truth is, the truth is that that America that he's talking about existed in the poetry and the minds of some, but it wasn't the reality for everybody. I mean, I don't want to. It's basically you've got a whole group of people that were enslaved, and you got a whole bunch of people that when they were released from slavery that were now being put into prison and forced to work. You've had women that did not have the right to vote and to become part of the decision-making process. You've had all kinds of things. And what immigrants are now we seeing as we move into the 19th century, I mean, as we move into the 20th century, uh, now we've got the other 
the other. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, you had the Chinese that were coming in, and they were here to build the railroad. After, as soon as the railroads were built, we asked the Chinese to leave. There were laws and immigration laws, specifically uh, uh, written to exclude the Chinese. There, if you were in my law school class, there's all kinds of case law from the U.S. Supreme Court all the way down to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, where there were restrictions on Chinese people. And one of the, and I wish I had even thought of that at the time when I wrote this, but a U.S. Supreme Court justice actually said. Um, you know, they don't look like us, they don't talk like us, and they're not even Christian, so, you know, what's the point? And they carry the day. So, what happened? So then we get the 20th century, my century. Um, you've got more people coming in from all around the world now. You've got Middle Easterners coming, you've got Eastern Europeans coming, you've got other Asians and Near Asians or Southern Asians coming into the United States. Uh, you have the idea of the Great Depression and the chicken in every pot. You have people all in soup lines, all together, and trying to form something. And then what happened? We had two world wars and the, the country kind of came together for a common cause. Um, the Europeans came. We wanted to exclude the Irish. We wanted to exclude the Italians. Um, we put uh, the Japanese in concentration camps. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative, believe me, but I'm explaining that these are immigration ideas that help form what is now America. Then in the later part of the 20th century, uh, you had the Beatles, the rock and roll, you had the Vietnam, civil rights, and you had the growing up of America, especially in Vietnam, and, and I'm sorry that this is all historical for you guys, uh, but the truth was, for the very first time, Americans were questioning the government. They, for the first time, they were trying to say, well, that's not quite true, what you're just telling me. And they were protests. In fact, when I was in uh, high school, uh, there was a sit-in in my high school because we had invaded Cambodia, and they told me that it would go in my permanent record, and I would never get a job. So, ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we had, of course, assassinations in the... Um, and uh, had, I assume that many of you have seen the movie The Godfather. Uh, in The Godfather, one of the very first lines, if not the first line, is I believe in America. And it's this young, uh, not this young, this older uh, uh, funeral director who says he believes in America and he's asking for help because his, his daughter had been um, sexually abused and, 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 and uh, excuse me, assaulted. And the idea of I believe in America, Marlon Brando, the godfather, says to him, then why are you coming to me? And he says, because I want justice. He felt he couldn't get justice in America. That was in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, now, let me get to your century, the 21st century. 9-11 um, was the first seminal event that a lot of people came together with. And then, Social media exploded. And now you all can relate to where we are. Um, I had people in court today. Uh, I had two cases today. And one of them, um, the bad guys were going to attack her. And how do you know that they threatened you? Because they got on Facebook. And I wanted to say, I probably can say, why don't you just unfriend them? And, and they won't bother you, but it gets a different work like that. Um, then, in this century, you had some events now that are not necessarily bringing us together, but as you all know, are tearing us apart. Uh, you have uh, the Colin Kaepernick uh, situation, which I know you all know about. You have people saying, after Obama, I want my country back. Again, all of you understand what that is. 
you have the wall, which is not necessarily a full wall, but a metaphorical wall to keep people out that we don't want here. So who decides who we want here and who we don't want here? Uh, that's the question. Who makes that decision? Well, I mean, I kind of do sometimes, but, but I mean, I, I talk, usually when I talk about immigration, I talk about the policies over the years. Um, and if, for those of you who remember, at one point it was illegal uh, for, uh, uh, to marry a Canadian uh, because some senator got in, was cuckolded and his wife went off with a Canadian, so the Canadians were not allowed for two years to become citizens. So you had that situation. You have the aforementioned uh, Chinese situation that I told you about. Uh, you have a situation now uh, where they want to keep uh, people out from Nigeria uh, for certain reasons that um, only make sense for the decision making. So, so who decides? Originally, our immigration policy, as I said in the 1800s, was to make a determination of uh, filling up this country, uh, making more of a gross domestic product, uh, being able to build ships and do this and do that. Uh, later, it got kind of, after World War II, when we stole some scientists uh, away from the Russians, some Nazi scientists away from the Russians for the rocket program, uh, we decided we want to get the best and the brightest. And so we've uh, developed a non-immigrant visa program to get the best and the brightest, whether it be uh, a great scientist, a great professor, uh, great thinker, uh, or great basketball player. Uh, that was really uh, the policy from about the 1950s moving forward. But then, what happened was, because of various American policies, we got a problem in Central America. And let me explain, in my opinion, why the whole thing started. Because in the 80s, Americans decided they wanted to use cocaine. And they wanted to party. And it's like the Wolf of Wall Street. You had all these people on drugs. The drugs had to come from someplace. They came primarily from Mexico. Mexico decided that we needed to branch out. They branched out to Central America. We, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, exported a lot of uh, gangbangers, and they became soldiers in the drugs. So what happens now is a number of things. One is a huge drug in Guatemala, so the Guatemalans can't work agriculture, and they're being hassled by these people, so they want to come. And in El Salvador and Honduras, they're being hassled by these drug people. And they are the most dangerous places on the planet outside of a war zone. And so those people are coming here. So you've got a lot of people coming here. And I have people coming to my court literally every day saying, Judge, I just want an opportunity. I want the opportunity to enjoy what you have, safety, a place to live, a place to work, uh, education for my kids. That's all I want. I'm not going to bother anybody. Well, unfortunately, that's not the test of how you get into America. If, if the test of getting into America was if you're a good person and you're going to add to our fabric of society, then that would be wonderful. We only want people that are going to be good neighbors. We only want people that are going to roll up their sleeves and be good citizens. That's not the test. They, um, you know, there's a whole fiction about jobs. Well, they're taking jobs away from America. Well, I don't know who cleans, who cleans the university here, and I don't know who sweeps the streets and so forth, but there's plenty of jobs. I don't know that I've ever, well, let's put it this way. In my neighborhood, I don't see Americans cutting the lawns. And I don't see, so 
And, and I don't see Americans <coughs> doing this kind of work or this kind of labor that people need. Well, if there was some kind of visa to allow them to do that, and if they didn't cause trouble with drunk driving or with this or with that, wife beating and so forth, then what difference does it make to you? It doesn't make any difference to me. But then you've got other problems, other issues. Remember I talked about the commonality of experience? Well, all that commonality experience changes just a little bit with each group of people that come here. For example, when the Italians come here, all of a sudden, Americans start eating pizza. We never had pizza before. When my sister and I were little, we never had tacos. Never had tacos. Didn't know a taco from whatever. Taco Tuesdays, right? <laughs> But what happens is because we start to assimilate some of the culture that you have. Um, some of you people may go to church, or your families go to church, and they may have a Korean service, or they may have a Spanish service at 2 o'clock with a guitar. I mean, we're subsuming them in. Now, there's the argument that the Europeans wanted to become Americans right away. In other words, uh, a father would slap his son in the head, you're not just that anymore, you're Joe, you know, being American now. Well, we have a lot of people now that come from Central America that may or not follow that ethic, and that's what irritates a lot of people. Um, we, when they had a big immigration rally for DACA in Los Angeles, they had 50,000 to 100,000 young people running in this, no, they weren't running in the street, they were waving flags, but they weren't waving American flags, they were waving Mexican flags. They were proud of their Mexican heritage. Okay, well I get it, that's wonderful, and, and God bless. But you're not going to persuade Americans that you belong here if you don't feel that you belong here. And that was a problem, they got the message, they switched the next, the next day. So, if the American dream is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is everyone's dream the same? Is everyone's dream the same? And I don't mean, oh, I want to be a marine biologist, or oh, I want to be an uh, uh, engineer, or I want to be a fullback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't look like a fullback. <laughs> I can see you don't want to be a fullback either. But, but the point is, more of a wide receiver type. <laughs> the truth is, though, not everyone has the same kind of dream. Like I said, I have these people from Central America, their only dream is to come in and be safe. I mean, why do people come to America, and I've said this before uh, in, 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 in other talks, they come to America because they know we're a country of law. We know that you know that you're going to get a voice. We, you know that you're going to be able to be relatively safe. I mean, a lady told me yesterday that she had been robbed at gunpoint. I said, well, you live in Northwest Houston, you could be robbed at gunpoint there too. But the difference is if you get robbed at gunpoint in Northwest Houston, aside from the fact that you'll be on Channel 13, the fact is the police will do something about it. Where in a lot of these countries, the police won't do anything about it because they're tied up with the bad guys, or they want to be paid. And um, we had uh, there's a group, I forget the name of them now, but in the Philippines, and they were semi-terrorists, and they used to we used to hear these Filipino cases. They used to shake us down for money all of the time. Well. Apparently, my friend, who was born in the Philippines to an American, uh, he was born there, but his parents were not military. Um, he said they would just go in and ask for five bucks or three bucks, whatever you could do. They'd stop the road, and uh, and if you resisted, then they would cause trouble. But you don't have that here. You don't drive down the spur five. Well, no one drives down the spur five except you folks. But <laughs> you don't drive down the spur five and expect to see armed men come out and ask for a donation. That doesn't happen in the United States. If it did, Channel 13 would be all over. I mean, it doesn't happen. 
And so the people want America because it is a, a, a land of dreams. I want my kids to do this, I want my kids to do that. But is there more to it? Is there, is there a different approach to what your dreams can be? I mean, I mentioned today, uh, earlier about sitting on the sofa eating Cheetos and watching Criminal Minds rerun. <laughs> if you do that all the time and, that's, and you're happy, is that enough? I mean, you guys were talking about moving on, but moving on with what? You have to know where you came from. You have to understand what it is that you want to do. I mean, you guys are all very, very bright. And you guys have a lot to do, but I mean, if you just want to sit there and eat Cheetos and watch Criminal Minds reruns, what's wrong with that? Well, I can tell you what's wrong with that, but that, I'm, let's leave that rhetorical for the moment. So, I open it up to the floor. Can someone tell me what an American is? Come on, guys. How many people in here consider themselves to be American? How many people, and I'm not going to raise my hand on this, how many people consider themselves yourselves to be Texans? Okay. Sir, what makes you a Texan? What makes a Texan different than someone from the Hoosier State of Indiana, where I went to law school? I think Texans have more pride in their history. Indiana, you probably have forces in Indiana history very as much as you have in Texas history. Okay, Texas has a very interesting and unique history, that's true. But that doesn't, what, people don't take Texas pride because, I mean, history is part of it, I would grant you that, but what else? There's a different way of thought in Texas, I think. It's more the uh, Texas is more of a First of all, what you say about Texas, you can say about America as well. America is proud of its history. In America, you can do what you want, correct? Yes? Yes. Okay. One thing I, I've learned that I wanted to share this with you, and I, this is an observation my wife doesn't believe in, but she's in Texas, so what does she know? <laughs> I, I lived in California for 25 years, and I noticed there's a huge difference between California and Texas. And, and, and a lot of uneducated, un uninformed, not uneducated, Californians will make jokes about Texans being rubes or whatever, and uneducated, uninformed, excuse me, not uneducated, Texans may say something about California in the land of foods and nuts, but what, the difference, the way I see it is, Texans, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Texans tend to care about individual rights. I'm a Texan, I want to do this, and I can do this. For example, helmets. I'm not wearing a helmet, I'm a Texan. You can't tell me to do this, you can't tell me to do that. And in California, I see a different approach, not necessarily wrong, one is wrong and one is right, but the approach is, this is a community. One of the reasons that gasoline right now in, in California is four dollars and fifty cents is because they add two cents or three cents to something every every uh, year. For example, we're going to have uh, we're going to get rid of all the potholes, but it's only going to cost you two cents. Whoa, two cents! <laughs> and then I'm only going to do this. Whoa! And all of a sudden now it's four fifty for a regular gas at Costco. But not many potholes. So it, it's just a different approach. One may be more socialist, one may be more independent. It doesn't make one right or one wrong. It's just a different way of looking at it. But the gentleman just mentioned what he thought a Texan would be, and I constantly that that's really what an American is, too. Does anyone else have a view? How do we get that? Is some, okay, let me ask you this. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say that I think anyone American, so long as like the values that they possess, I think, align with what America seems to possess. So that's like working hard, like this idea of like individualism as opposed to like collectivism. 
um, and other values that I think America. Let, let me ask you this. On. You ever been to England? No. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but, but you know what an English person is like. English people, we talk about commonality of experience. They have a stiff upper lip. Uh, they have uh, a certain aristocracy. It, 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 in fact, I meant Matt to mention this earlier. If, I remember when I was a kid watching this show on PBS, and they showed this man was a, a river guy on the Thames River. And he used to do the boat. And he said, I'm going to be a river guy because my father was a river guy and my grandfather was a river guy. So he may have the best values in the world, but not necessarily. He's not going to eat. Okay? There was a, a book. I, I talk about literature. I love literature. Jude the Obscure, written by Thomas Hardy. Anyone familiar with that book? You are. All right, don't raise your hand. Jude the Obscure was this guy who was amazing. He used to make walls and bricks and stuff like that, make walls. And he got into his head that he may want to go to college. And he was going to go to college by, darn it, and he was going to make something of himself. And then there's a, a scene where he meets this girl, and, and I love this scene. They have sex, and the whole thing lasts about eight seconds. <laughs> Not very fulfilling, but of course she gets pregnant because it's the book. And it's a lesson. And his whole future dreams of college and becoming someone just get crazy. And he becomes obscure, hence the title struck too obscure. Now, that was written in the 1800s. Um, and that may have been truer there in England, but I don't know that's necessarily true in the United States. You mentioned in the United States that you have values. Does everyone have the same value system? What makes the American value system? Who determines what the American value system is? You mentioned working hard. I think working hard is great, and I know all of you are working hard. Yes, ma'am. Shared values. Like, give me one. Like, family. Like, caring about your family. Oh, caring about your family. Yeah. Okay. Now, when I talk about these various centuries, you could have cared about your family too. The cows came home <coughs> as a woman, but there was a glass ceiling that was keeping you from fulfilling your full potential. But were you following the American view? My dad once told me, he, would, he worked for the government, he was an uh, air traffic controller, and in fact he was the first black air traffic controller in New England, but the issue was, he said, if I could just make $100 a week, I'll have it made. That's $5,000 a year. He, he told me that, he really felt that way. Couldn't do that now. But, he bought a house. He bought a car, he had kids, he built a bigger house, he had more kids, he had built a bigger house, and the fact is, he actually had the American dream of us being able to take care of his family. He didn't, we didn't have a white picket fence, though. And, uh, and, uh, and, I don't know, is that enough? There was a hand over here. Sir, did you ask? Oh, uh I just want to point out that I think part that I don't know that there is either a, that there is a consistent definition of being American because so many people have different ideas. I mean, she was talking about how anyone can be an American. I can name plenty of Americans who say the same things. You talked about there was a distinction earlier about the distinction between someone being a Texan and someone being from Indiana. A lot of people wouldn't consider those things mutually exclusive. I mean, Sam Houston was a governor of Tennessee. I think. The, I think. <laughs> yeah, but that was too. Being, I think that being taxed to a large degree is. Let, let me ask you. Excuse me, sir. Let me ask you this. You ever travel internationally? Once. Where'd you go? Uh, Cabo. The UK, France, and Italy. Okay, let's say Italy, for example. If 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 you went to Italy with someone from Indiana, you're both American, right? The, if the Italians are going to ask you where you're from, you're going to say, I'm, well, you may say you're from Texas, but you understand the point. They're going to know that you're American. 
whether you're from North Carolina or whether you're from, you know, Utah. So, and they're not going to think that you're American is necessarily because of your shared values. They're going to know you're American because one, you're carrying an American passport, and two, you're not taking any crap from anybody. When I was, uh, I went to a, I went, I, I was a lawyer, I went to immigration, uh, I went to immigration a lot, but there was an I-130 interview, that's where they have the marriage interview, the, group, the face cream kind of questions, and um, I was walking in and there was a couple standing in the door, pointing out where they should go, and this woman was bossing this guy around, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and I turned to another lawyer and said, she's an American. <laughs> She said she's American because she's not taking any crap from anybody. Um, yes, sir. Yes, yeah, on the back. Oh, uh, can the answer be as simple as the person is American if he or she is uh, born here or naturalized? Well, that's the legal definition of an American. But let's listen to this. This is this is going to amaze you. I've had people that have lived that were born in this country that have lived here for 25 years and couldn't speak English. Is that person an American? If he or she was what? Yes. No, I said they were born here. So the person doesn't have that, and does the, does the language even matter? Ma'am? Could you maybe just be an American if you yourself identify as an American? Now that's an interesting point. I gotta tell you another funny story. Well, it's funny to me, you may not think it's funny. I had a client once, and um, he had been, this, gosh, there was an old movie called Marnie. It was about this guy that was really ugly, and he couldn't get a woman, and he, and anyway, it, it's Ernest Borg 9, it's in the 40s. It was, Decent, but I don't know what we call that today. But anyway, I had this guy, I called it my Marty case. He, he worked in a tropical fish store. And all he did was tropical fish, but he never did get a girlfriend. Let's put it that way. And he's in his 40s. And he, to, to get the, this woman said that she would, in a biblical sense, be with him if he could get her some cocaine. He got some cocaine. Guess what? He got arrested. He calls them the big guns. He calls me. In. So, so think about this. The United States now wants to deport him. This guy was born in Russia. He lived there for a total of one year. He didn't even know he wasn't a citizen. He was uh, went to the boys' Cub Scouts. He lived in Maryland. He lived in a cut down, elementary school, whatever, and he ended up in California and he was doing this thing. And it's fascinating. So, I remember we were standing in front of him and he asked him, the judge asked him, do you have your green card with you? Because you have to carry your green card all the time. And in those days, you had one for life. And he says, no judge, I don't, because it has a picture of a baby on it I couldn't get to drink. I couldn't even get a drink with it. Then he said, and this is a lawyer you don't want to hear. We're in law school, we can talk more about this. He, then he said, oh, but I do have my voter registration card. <laughs> I, what? And, and the judge said, well, how did you get that? And he said, I was coming out of Ralph's grocery store, and the lady said, did you register to vote? I said, no. So she registered me. <laughs> Uh, in those days, I, I, I won his case. If it was in court now, he wouldn't have won his case, because the laws have gotten so much strict, more stringent. But I was ready to, to fall into the earth. Yes? Well, it seems like it's going to be hard to define what an American is when Americans can't decide what that is. I mean, we're still having debates about amendments in our own Constitution, and because but, that, but don't Americans do that? Don't we have a debate about that stuff? Sure, but because we're a, a federation of states, each with their own culture. Federations. Wow. <laughs> Man. 
I don't know that you're an American, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> at a racial word, but um, it almost sounds like Star Wars, a uh, fake federation. No, um, I know what you're trying to say, but uh, it, it, I mean, we debate, we argue, but it, it's like we're siblings. And we're fighting. I mean, my sister and I never fought, but we fought with other other of our siblings. But you, I mean, you fight, you argue, but it, it, when, when things are down, it's like World War II, everyone just put that aside and had a common cause. I'm not saying we need something bad like that to be a common cause. Oh, we just died. I, that was on my list, too. Um, all of you know exactly how you felt about Kobe one way or the other. Some people, many people were inspired by the Mamba mentality. Some people were, uh, found it egregious of what had happened in Colorado. Uh, many people felt uh, sorry because uh, he was a father and so forth. But it's something that everyone felt, but not everybody agreed with. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think that necessarily means that. And, 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 and I mentioned England, but let's look at Canada. My grandfather was actually from Canada. Excuse me. Most of you, we have many... Now this is going to blow your mind. We have many um, stereotypes of what Canadians are very polite, very this, very that. Uh, we have very uh, many stereotypes of what Filipinas are. We have very... And you can ask me about that later. We have very about Russians, about this or about that. But why is America different? It's because we have people from all of those places coming here. That's what makes America different. No one, if I look at how many of you people, maybe six, seven generations, in fact, six, seven generations of Americans, but they all came from someplace else except for the indigenous, or if you will, the Indians. And, and, and that's okay. But it, it, it's like the law. It, it's forever forming itself. It's forever living. Right now, our country is being pulled apart for various reasons that you identify. But it's cyclical. I pray to God it's cyclical, and we'll come back together. And there will be some reason that we'll come back together. Maybe the space program. It may be the space force. It may be, it, it may be any number of things, and maybe some environmental thing. I know some of you have to go. Uh, if uh, is it time for them to go? It is time. I apologize, um, but thank you so much for allowing me to come here.